I think all of this reflection on learning on not just the academics and the subject, which faculty have a lot to say, but for our listeners to be able to say, we want the best learning. We want the best community. We want the best experience for our students. And that is an equal um, bridge of the academic piece. And then what I call lab work, right? Because it's like, you might go and learn psychology, but your lab is, working with your roommate or, or having to live with your roommate, right? That's your lab where all of that stuff that you're learning about now, all of a sudden, this becomes a, an application for you to be able to practice. You're going doing speech class. The lab is you have to convince your group of friends to not go do something stupid. That's persuasive communication. That's where you're going to actually get that practice. And so having the best learning and the best community experience comes when schools are putting equal emphasis on both sides. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Rachel Phillips Buck, VP for Student Success at Ferris Resources. I'm joined today by Mr. Anthony Mercury. Hello, sir. Zup, how are you? I'm good. For the first, so we took the last two weeks off I stood you up last week because I was on a plane yeah. and then the week before that I was at a conference, but I think that I have, we have done these every Tuesday for six months or something like that. So I'm done taking off now. Okay. Well, I'm good. Because, I'm, because I've got now my nose you stood because... me up. You stood me up at the last minute. <laughs> Terrible. It's really sad. Um, Lindsay has joined us, thus completing her perfect attendance record. Hey, Lindsay, good to see you. Um, okay, so I have some housekeeping things I have to tell you about. You guys, please get connected with us. Anthony and I today are talking about the very last in our uh, fall session on Tinto's article about conditions for great student success. So today we're gonna to be talking about learning, but we have a whole series of those um, that you can go to YouTube or Spotify or any place that you get podcasts. I've heard from so many of you um, that you are listening to us in the car and that you enjoy our content. So thank you for that feedback. It's always nice to hear that we are entertaining at the very least. Um, I, Anthony, have pictures to show you. Hmm. Don't don't show the um, don't show the nine year old with my funky haircut. Well, I am, but I am going to show a equally embarrassing picture of me. And the reason I'm mentioning this is just because. Hold on, wait. I'm not ready for that picture. Is just because if you normally join us by podcast, these pictures are worth joining us on Zoom. So I'm just giving you a heads up so everybody can rush to the video, okay? Okay, first of all, I saw this the other day and I thought it was hilarious and that you would appreciate it. Well, I um, the rest from the host. Well, I appreciate you staying muted. You can see exactly what you're thinking based on your facial expression. I'm going to ask you to turn off your video as well. Thank you. I don't know how to not be this person. <laughs> this is me. The joke around the office is, first of all, Rachel, your face is showing because if somebody is saying something stupid, you can tell on my face. Also, Trey was just trying to get some still shots for our Instagram. And he's like, hey, can you just give a soft smile? Because you're doing a lot of crazy things with your, you're very expressive. So this well, is on my story. podcast, I get text messages in the private chats like, dude, are you pissed off? Like, no, I'm listening. <laughs> Everybody can see you, you know. <laughs> Okay, are you ready for our oh, mutual boy. humiliation? Oh boy, go ahead. It's good. It's I feel like we're I think I feel like we're on par. Well, I think we should have dated. <laughs> yeah. Think how beautiful our children would have been. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, Listen, you're a lot better looking than I am in that picture. No. Oh my gosh. These two people both let's just say we were not at our peak here. Thank yeah, goodness. I, I outgrew that face. <laughs> But th those ears, those ears are still there, though. Oh, my gosh. Well, I, I'm i sure you weren't talking to me when you uh, put this on your Instagram and said, I know I'm going to regret this. But I, I kind of felt like it was a message to me. <laughs> Everybody wants to know who the hell cut my hair. And I was like, I don't know. It looked like a lawnmower. 
Listen, when Matt saw these two pictures together, he said, I feel like both of your parents were trying to save money by doing their own hoi haircuts, you know? And I'm like, I think that's probably pretty accurate. Okay, um, so I have 19 questions for you. Okay, I can't imagine what else is left. I know, it's, it's getting rough. So these are based on this TV show called Alone. Do you know the show where it's like they go into, okay, so they're allowed to take 10 items and then they go into what's essentially like Alaska, like British Columbia, and they have to stay in the woods with nobody. There's no camera people. There's nothing. They have to operate their own camera. Uh -huh. They can't talk to anybody. They are alone and you just stay as long as you can. And the person who stays the longest wins, but you don't know what everybody else is doing because they're scattered all over the island. Okay. So context, the winners stay between 50 and a hundred days. I think there's like eight seasons. Okay. Wow. It's a really long time. And oftentimes what gets them is they're alone. Like they have nobody to talk to you. They're just totally alone. Okay. So this is my 19 questions based on this TV show. What would you rather? Okay. Ruff, ruff. Okay, you can either bring a flashlight or an axe. Which one? Axe. Ax. Winter or summer? Summer. Soap or toothpaste? Toothpaste. A tarp or a rope? Tarp. Would you rather spend your time gathering plants or trapping mice to eat? Gathering plants. A pot or a canteen? Pot. A towel or a razor? Towel. A deck of cards or dice? Deck of cards. Would you rather have a bow or a fishing net? Fishing net. Two pounds of beef jerky or two pounds of chocolate? Chocolate. A pocket knife or a roll of duct tape? Pocket knife. One item that you can take from a standard hotel room? The mattress. That's a good one. Um, bug repellent or sunscreen? Bug repellent. See, my Irish self would have to take sunscreen. Bro, my, um, if there's a thousand people standing in a field of mosquitoes, the 999 people have nothing to worry about. because And you're, you're like candy to them. Okay, you can bring one luxury item besides your mattress. What would it be? Um, clean underwear. Okay. All right. Let's assume you've made it 30 days and you can either have a hot shower or you can make one phone call. Hot shower. What one food would you be dreaming about? Um, pasta with bolognese sauce. Okay. You have to always either wear a tie or dress shoes. Which one? A tie. Okay. And lastly, would you take a sewing kit or a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue? A sewing kit. Wow. I, I feel like you might be able to win this, Anthony. Based on those answers, I feel like learned something about you today. Thank you for playing with me. Thank you. So um, I have State of the Union for us. There's a lot of interesting th things going on. And then I want to finish up our Tinto article about learning communities where he's really talking about um, the lab of learning academics in a community on a college campus. So let's do okay. State of the Union. Okay. There are some interesting things going on. Rachel Elam's gonna chat um, these links to you if you're interested in them. So first of all, over uh, 500,000 service workers, public service workers are about to get relief based on this overhaul of the public service loan forgiveness program. I don't know if you've heard about this, but there's a lot of people who their loans were supposed to be forgiven if they worked for 10 years in the public sector doing public service. But the whole program's a wreck. It's like they would sell their debts to someone else and not tell them so that the people who were making payments would keep making them, but it, they would be delinquent because another company owned it. Or right. it would be like they didn't pay off 10 cents. And so the program's like, never mind, we're not going to forgive your debts. Or the worst, Anthony, is people who have been in the public sector for like nine years, eight years, and then the pandemic came and they got fired and it's not continual employment. And so they're like, never mind, we're not going to forgive your loans. Oh, wow. So thank goodness they're, they're making yeah. uh -huh. a huge overhaul. So if you are one of those people who are a teacher and we're pursuing that, this is really good news for you. And there's a lot of information, details. Yeah, about I heard about it, but I didn't know anything about the particulars. Yeah. 
So it's going to be, it's just, it's, it has been a rock. Um, you and I have been talking about the name image likeness for our athletes. So a great article today, the University of Alabama quarterback Bryce Young, who by late July had already made a million dollars in endorsement deals, which is amazing. The female athletes at Brigham Young University are going to earn up to $6,000 a semester each based on like appearances and if they're tweeting about different things. Um, they also, Brigham Young also uh, created a deal for all 123 football players that's going to benefit them based on some of the things that they do. So pretty amazing to see kind of how that's shaking out. The article that's in the chat, though, also talks about some of those. Um, so obviously, football players are going to make a lot of money, but there are also people who are less popular thinking about like golf, people who play golf or people who, you know, are playing softball, those sorts of things. Although I read that uh, women who play volleyball have the highest uh, agreements right now. So really, yeah. Pretty exciting. That's fantastic. You know, listen, when we were kids, we, this was like kind of like voodoo. This was not cool to, to even talk about. And to see it come into uh, the forefront is amazing. Because awesome. so these schools are making millions and billions of dollars off of these kids, you know, for them to make at least a couple of dollars, like even yeah. 6000 a semester where that one kid's making a million. I mean, it's fantastic. It's awesome. In fact, Ferris is going to announce we're about to sponsor a female uh, volleyball athlete. And so look for that announcement. because Oh, Nina Mercury. Congratulations oh, to Nina. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> Um, okay. she's, she's sponsored by Anthony Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, she's, she's had a sponsorship for a while now. <laughs> um, okay. New Jersey has a new law that requires shopping sheets for students, which this is crazy town to me. So there has previously been a law that said universities have to provide for only prospective students, a shopping sheet, which is what tells the student how much the college costs what the loans are that they're taking, and then their estimated debt. It used to be that the only people who were required to get that were prospective students. Right. Now, thank goodness, New Jersey is like, hey, schools have to give it to all students. You have to give a student a piece of paper that says, this is what it costs, this is what your loan is, this is how much we think you're gonna have to repay. I don't understand why that hasn't been in place forever. That well, just seems kind of, like kind of like calories on the back of a package. Once you tell people about the calories on the back of a package, they may they may not eat it. Right. Yep. So good job, New Jersey. Let's all follow suit with that. Okay. Um. Also, Jersey great... did something good. What? Never yeah. Mind. Yeah. I'm they did it Jersey. <laughs> they're, I'm they're, I'm allowed. they're leaders. They're leaders in the cheap. What is it called? Short sheet? No, shopping. It well, does have a good education system. Yeah. Um, also, great news coming out of historically black colleges and universities. I love this. 28 um, HBCUs have partnered with the Strata Education Network. The Strata Ed Education Network, first of all, spent a, listen a year long listening tour where they went to all 28 of these colleges and they said, What is it that you need? Um, and what rose to the forefront was colleges saying we need career readiness, we need leadership opportunities, um, and we need a network of hiring for our students. So Strata Education Network is investing $25 million in these schools. Every school is going to choose three students every four years, so a total of 12 students, which are going to be our, our Strata scholars. They're going to get $7,000 annually. Um, and then they're going to work <clears throat> to create these internship opportunities. What I really love, because you know these schools serve a disproportionate number of first-generation college students um, who don't have the professional connections in the corporate world that would lead to those networking opportunities. So it's really important for HBCUs yeah, to offer that. That's critical. You know, I just made some connections with some young people, and and like those little connections, that one phone call changed everything for them, and. It's critical. It's absolutely yeah. critical. Um, just one phone call can change somebody's life. Absolutely. You're always so good about that, Anthony. If you think about like your whole network and the way that you're so eager 
to help other people be successful. It's, I think, really remarkable. I mean, even in your your show, you're always like, hey, if you need a job, you know, let me know. I'll it's it's kind of it's kind of like, you know, seeing somebody drown and not, you know, not throw them a life vest. You see somebody struggling, they went to school, they did all the right things, they're good kids, they're good people. <clears> and <throat> all they need to do is make a phone call. I don't know if I made this analogy last time, but it's like you're you say you're an actress and you want to be on Broadway, and every day you go in an elevator. And Mr. Smith gets on the elevator on the fourth floor. You get on the fifth floor and you go down the elevator every morning. You say, good morning, Mr. Smith. Good morning, young lady. And then you leave. And he goes to the playhouse that you're trying to become an actress in. But you never know who he is because you guys don't connect. And every single day, your moment is being passed by simply because no one connected you to. And that happens every single day. That's a great analogy. Because the truth is, when you start making those connections, it is a small world right? Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, you know, so-and-so and I know so. So it is a foot in the door a lot of times. I was just, one of the reasons I was in Vegas is to make that connection. I just got a, a young man, um, a job, a really good job at the MGM and went down there, had dinner with the, my friend who's the boss and, you know, connected the two. And um, it, it was a great feeling. Awesome. That's great. Okay. My last uh, state of the union, which you guys, I do not have time to do this article justice. So I would recommend that you go and read it. It's called higher ed. We've got a morale problem and a free t-shirt won't fix it. (laughs) So it is a great meaty article. Let me give you the highlights. Um, They basically are saying that we have moved from burnout, which Anthony, you and I have talked about. We have moved from burnout to now, um, a demoralization. And I will tell you that as I'm meeting with schools, it's a different energy. It's not like I'm just tired. It's like, I don't care. It's, this is not going great. Right. So this says, whereas burnout is when staff are depleted, demoralization happens when staff are constantly thwarted in their ability to enact the values that brought them into the profession. So like, here's what I signed up for and I am actively being thwarted. Like you may not do whatever those things, those important things are. So this article is saying like, obviously that's been around for a long time, people feeling overworked. I will tell you though, that people feel like leaders aren't listening. Um, They're not answering questions transparently. We've always had a problem with low compensation, but I did a spark meeting with the school yesterday and Matt was showing them like, You've done in this semester, 200 hours of COVID work on top of your job. So you already wow. feel like you're doing, you have low compensation, but now we have these additional excessive work demands. Um, and some schools, I think if we're honest, the inadequate staffing is a strategy where we just say in this article, it talks about tolerable sub optimization. Like, how can we not invest and still kind of get away with everybody just doing what they're, they're used to being? That, so, that's what's happening in the hotel business. They're, they're, they're breaking it little by little until total collapse. And you're seeing it in service standards. I can't, I, I make a phone call uh, to the front desk. Good luck. Might as well t- uh, send the message in the bottle. Anthony, I was in Fort Worth the other day with my family at a very nice hotel. It was shocking how few people were working there. The restaurant was closed. I couldn't get ice. They wouldn't bring me a pillow. Like I couldn't find anybody in the whole whole hotel. And they and they and they charge you about what you usually pay, yes. if not more. Yeah. So yeah, and it's 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 the value proposition has been, you know, the rubber band is basically breaking. Yeah. Um one thing that I thought was really interesting in this article is that they talked about You know, you and I spent a year talking about Kintsugi breaking something and bringing it back more beautiful. And they're talking about how this demoralization comes from things being unstable and all of staff and faculty being like, we could do better. We could do different. We could, you know, we could fix it more beautifully. And a knee jerk reaction from a lot of leadership that's like, no, we're doing it the same way we've always done it. And that frustration that's coming up. Um, and then the, the last thing I'll point out in this article is uh, this discussion about the difference between toxic positivity. So, you know, for so many months, we've had leaders who've had to say, like, it's okay, it's going to be fine, don't worry, everything's okay. And now that we have more of a realization about where we are, what they're saying is this toxic positivity is shutting down conversations that should be happening. It's fine, it's fine, right? 
And they're leading people towards what they're calling critical hope, which is acknowledging we're in the midst of a radical transformation and welcoming the complexity and discomfort as cornerstones of a process to re reimagine higher education. And I love that. Yeah, I think what people are forgetting is that we've all been through some serious trauma in the last two years. Yes. And we're, we're like, we're all walking around like everything's fine. And it's That's not. Right. That's so interesting, Anthony, because that's exactly what they said was like, hey, we can't all I mean, it's it's the language of back to normal or we're just going to do business as usual. And yet you have a world who has been through serious trauma and you don't know what other people's trauma looks like. And we can't just all pretend like it's fine. Right. So right. anyway, highly recommend that article. I love it. All right, let's, oh shoot, I didn't do, sorry. And that's the State of the Union. It's terrible. Trey said that maybe I should just record it and we should put it on a button so that then when I finish, he can just push and then it will just come out. I think you should just keep practicing it. Okay, I thank you. I, I like, I, I, the best part of that is you saying, oh shoot. <laughs> appreciate that you will be in this experiment with me, Anthony. It's very helpful. <laughs> okay. So our topic today is coming from Tinto, our article. Remember, access without support is not opportunity. We've been preaching that for a long time. Um, our list of things that we've been talking about, uh, conditions for student success, commitment, expectation, support, feedback, involvement. Today, we're going to be talking about learning. I'll just tell you that um, Tinto is really funny about learning in this article because his emphasis is um, strongly on classroom learning. He's from the academic side of the house. He was faculty. He has a lot to say about kind of faculty perspective on learning. But we are always trying to bridge the gap between academics and student development. And so I want to broaden this idea of learning a little bit and talk about it in the context of really what happens um, in college. So one of the first things he, he talks about is that students are either leaving college because the learning is too rigorous. It's totally overwhelming. They can't be successful. We don't have the right uh, support for them. But sometimes students are leaving college because it is not rigorous enough. They are looking at what they're paying for and what their classes are like. And they're like, this is not real college. I don't feel like I'm learning what I need to. Talking about the value proposition, I don't really feel like what I'm paying for is worth what I'm getting. And I was wondering for you, Anthony, do you have a hardest class that you remember? Like the class where you were like, not... Not there's no support, so I can't possibly be successful, but the like, this is a really hard class with super high expectations. Probability and statistics. Ooh. Two. That might, that might be mine too. Probability statistic two. That, that about kicked my butt. I got an A, but that I remember to this day when I think about college, I think about sitting in the grass under a tree and contemplating dropping out of school. <laughs> because of that class? I, it was miserable. Was, I didn't understand it. I had no idea what the hell was going on. Thank God my friend's wife was also in the class and she helped me, but I, it was, it was miserable. And look how successful you've been in your life. You know what I'm yes. saying? The probability of me um, <laughs> being successful is statistically unachievable. I thought. <laughs> Mine, when I was in high school, I took calculus. I thought I, so statistics in college was mine also. I was just like, I don't know what we're talking about. And I had, I didn't have a great teacher, but in calculus in high school, I took calculus and I literally I cannot tell you a single thing about calculus. Yeah, I, listen, I, went to, I went to algebra. That was it. I, I could never get to calculus <laughs> and trigonometry. And, and, and it's funny because our next door neighbor, she's a PhD in math. And if you speak to her, you would never know you. She's like a regular person and like a <laughs> smart lady, but not like somebody I would say, wow, smart lady. Yeah. She's like in charge of the math program in a very prestigious school in New York City. And she just gets it, man. Wow. Crazy. I, I love that when people's brains work that way, you know, like whatever it is, there are people who I one time did career counseling for a student who after I did his career test, he clearly was an accountant. Like that's the way his brain was thinking, right. but he wanted to be a counselor. And I was like, Hey, why do you want to be a counselor? And he's like, because it's the hardest profession. And I was wow. like, I have some bad news for you. 
only for you is it the hardest profession, right? Like for somebody who's gifted in that way, I don't right. think it's hard at all. Right. You right. should go be an accountant. That's right. going to be it, a great profession. It's, it's um, like when you take over a broken hotel, for me, I literally see everything that's broken, how to fix it within hours, literally, not even days. And some people will look at where do you start? Like they're so overwhelmed. And it's like, <laughs> to me, it's even when I was a young man, like it was like very simple to me. Like it all it's like a math problem that I can solve almost instantly without using a calculator. Yeah. Which is such a great analogy because that is like, if you're doing the thing that makes sense to you, it just makes sense to you. And there are other things where you're like, we talk about it, like writing with your left hand, right? There are some things for me, I'm right hand dominant. It is like writing with my left hand to have to do that. Yeah, it's exhausting. Yeah, it's, it, it's shocking to me because it's it, like, to me, if you saw, you know, Hotel Impossible, 108 episodes, it all came to me relatively quickly outside of maybe yeah. two shows that I really had to work hard to figure it out. It, it's just, you know, some things come to, uh, to people, but it's very interesting that you, a lot of kids are dropping out because they don't think it's rigorous enough and they're paying their bills. So they, they want, listen, I, I, I look at my children's uh, education and I feel, um, you know, did they get everything that they should have gotten? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So we always say that there's a place. In fact, I think one of our action items um, today is that you're looking at the students who are leaving and you're trying to understand which of those places do they fall? Did they go home at Thanksgiving and they're like, hey, is college supposed to be hard? Right. And their parents are like, what did you learn? And but and they're like, I'm not learning anything. And that's the place where a parent's going to be like, um, I think maybe we better find a different place yeah, for you. Yeah. yeah, a lot of kids are learning that um, Coors Light doesn't taste as good as Michelob Light. <laughs> I don't think they mentioned that at the dinner table. I think they're like, no, I haven't learned anything actually. <laughs> okay. So the next thing Tinto talks about is a learning community. And this was a concept that was, I think, pretty novel in the nineties. I feel like it's pretty mainstream now. It's the idea that you have both academics and development together. So you might live in the same res hall, and then you take a couple of classes together and you have the same major together. And we're trying to create these smaller communities. Um, I would like for us to talk about learning communities. And so again, Tinto would say that this is primarily about learning and you have a community in which you're learning. But I wanna put equal weight on learning communities and I wanna talk about academics and student development and like classroom and lab. And by that, I mean, a learning community is really about this experiment that, that young adults are doing where for the first time they have left where they come from for our traditional students at a four-year institution, let's say, and they are joining a new community where they are learning and working and playing and eating and sleeping and dating in this new group of people. And learning is one of the things that they're doing in that community, but there's all of this other stuff as we are learning how to be adults that are happening because we're in a new community. I can't think of another community experiment like college. Military. Well, I was gonna ask you, do you think that that's the same thing for you? Like- 100%, um, because you're, and maybe even more intense because there's a mission and the mission is usually, you know, life or death. Right. So you immediately go from your parents' house to, you know, the, the, the military house. And you have to like learn how to balance a checkbook, how to rent a car or lease a car, buy a car, yeah. maybe have a part-time job on the side and you know, function, you know, live in a dorm and function with people from all different walks of life. You know, in colleges, a lot of time, there, it's almost the same walk of life. It's like, okay, you, you come from this you know, uh, neighborhood, this kind of lifestyle, and the college almost represents that. Yeah. In the military, you go from you know everywhere, um, and then you have, and then you have a mission, and right. the mission is we're one and we're um, a team, and there's nobody bigger than a team, and um, so yeah, I think it's intense. I think it's easier going to the military than it is to college because, like, that mission binds you, whereas in the college. You're all, you're trying to keep up. We're not trying to keep yeah. up in the military. We're all trying to do the same <laughs> thing, and 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 for the same goal. In in college, you're trying to be the coolest or the smartest or the most fashion easterist or whatever. Or my TikTok's been your TikTok. So there's so many social um, yeah. 
things pulling at you. So yeah, I think I think it's unique, um, but it's similar to the military. It's also interesting because the military has a very clear structure and you know what who is in charge and i can tell you to do this and you are going to do this thing right that's your point where in college it's so difficult because it is it is you're you're you want independence you are for the first time for some people experiencing independence and so you're learning about yourself but you also are learning about yourself with these other people like how are you going to be with and other may, and, and in college, you may step up to a teacher or a guidance counselor and, and you know, hold them accountable for, for, for something that may be wrong. In the yeah. military, that is not the case. <laughs> it's like you, have, have, a higher rank, you yeah. have a higher rank, you're smarter than I am, I'll straight up. Yeah. So would you say then that the military was your best experience with community? Or is there another place? Like, I don't know when you're working in a hotel, are you... Are you trying to build a healthy community? Well, the, the military, I would say, was the strongest sense of community, yes. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the hotel business, I, I got a lot of responsibility young. So I'm trying to build a community, but I'm not really the mayor of the community. I'm more of the architect of the community. Yeah. And, and I don't see this clearly as the mayor. I'm not as patient as the mayor. I'm not as, you know, shaking hands and kissing babies yeah. like the mayor. I'm like, this is the structure and we got to fall in to save our city. And then eventually I become the mayor. But by then I'm already kind of, um, I don't I, really, I, I don't, I always thought I had perspective of my, of my businesses, but in retrospect, I don't know if I really did. I know I had perspective of the business and everybody building as a team, but I don't know if I cared about community as much as I should have. Or as much as if you were in a functioning hotel, I would care about. Whereas yeah. when I'm losing a hotel and the owner is about to go bankrupt, the community is not, your, is, is not your first priority. Yeah, that is that is a great point. Um, which I would just like to take a side conversation with you and talk about group work. Because I don't know how you feel about group work, like in college where they like put everybody on a team and we all have to work together. And it's like the worst thing ever because most of the time people don't do their group work. And I was and thinking as I was- do all the work. Yeah. Well, Anthony, I wish somebody had told me when I was on those groups and I was like, I hate this stuff, that that's how the world is. Like you're, sorry, you think that you are learning on that team about whatever the subject is, no. The real learning is coming, being on a team with all of these other people who are different from you and some of them aren't gonna show up and some of them are super bossy and some of them, right? Rachel, you would be doing all the work and I would be skating. I don't think that's true, but I will tell you. So I'm gonna ask you about your role on a, on in group work. Okay, I want you to think about it. As I reflected on my role in group work, which this is 100% consistent, whether I'm in high school or college or now, I'm like, I will do my work alone. I do not need to like bring all of you with me. Just tell me what you want me to accomplish. And then I'm going to go do my work. Why do we have to talk about it? Why do we have to sit around the table? Why do we have to like very autonomous, very like I will get it done, but I don't really want to do it with you. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> so if you think about like, are you always the leader on a team? No, I actually, if there's a group, right, there's eight of us right now. So we all just get on the eight team. I am the, I'm going to be the eighth out of eighth. I'm going to make myself so small. And so like, everybody's going to take their roles. Everybody's going to step up in what they do. And whatever crumb falls my way and they ask me to pick it up, I'll pick it up. I am not going to be in any way, shape or form the leader. Unless I'm appointed the leader, yeah. I will not take that role. Or so is that because you're like, it doesn't matter what's left over. I can probably do it. Or is it, why, why is that? Um, I, I probably, wow, you're really getting into psychology. Probably because <laughs> I think everybody probably smarter than me on the team and probably better than me on the team. Um, and I'm going to let the natural abilities fall out. And then I'll pick up whatever they think I should pick up and probably whatever they think I should pick up, I'll probably be able to manage. Um, and yeah. I, I really am not the, I'm the last person to raise my hand and say, I want to be the leader of the team. The last person, which is shocking to people. It but is shocking. Yeah. I, if you make me the leader, get out of my way. I'm going to be the right. leader. 
Right. But I am not looking for that leadership role I, unless you give it to me. That's really funny because I do think group work, you have, a, I mean, my reflection on leadership is I, I'm, unless you say, hey, will you lead us? I'm not going to boss everybody around. I'm, I'm going to do it myself. And in fact, the idea of leadership personally is a, is a fairly new concept because it means you have to have a team and you have to have a group of people that you're helping accomplish a thing versus kind of my Emma, which is like, I'm going to do whatever I need to do. Like I'm just going right. So yeah. I, I don't want to, I don't want people to get mad at me. Like, unless, unless there is a dynamic where it's like Anthony needs to control all these people and he has the leadership <laughs> skills to do it, then I'll do it. But I, like, I don't want to get everybody get mad at me. Like if you ask me to lead the team, we're winning. Right, like, right. but everybody's going to, everybody's going to be in pain. You're, right. you're, we're winning. Like you're all going, we're going to win. That's it. And if I'm leading the team, I may not be liked, but we're going to win. And yeah. I, I'd rather not be in that position if I don't have to. Win. That's a, such a great perspective. Like I will apologize afterwards for whatever happened in this room. We will be successful, but I might have right, to be but, like- but If you're asking me to lead, it, it, comes with, it comes with a couple of issues. And the one thing is, I don't like, like, I don't like, now if we lost and I'm at the leader of the team, I'm fine, whatever. You guys were fine. We didn't, we didn't win fine. I don't care. Yeah. They put me in charge. What the hell am I in charge for if we're not going to win? So we're going to either win or die trying. But then if we lose, we're going to be good losers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I do think it would be so helpful for everybody to reflect about group work and what their position on the team is and has that changed. Right. Um, and also I'm going to start telling my daughter, like, sorry, even in fourth grade group work is learning how to be in the world. That is a learning community because you better figure out Every kid in your class is going to grow up to be an adult and going to have the same crazy stuff that you're dealing with. And you just have to learn how to get along with people. Listen, you, 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 I can identify kids that almost uh, uh, pretty consistently when I talk to new people, I can pretty much tell you if they've been in, an athlete in, in school. And um, and that it doesn't have to be like a baseball player. It could be even even if you were on a chess team or so that's almost an athlete. But if you were part of a community, yeah. and I see it even with the kids I know, it's like I can tell my daughter Nina has been on a team. You can just see it, right? And yeah. I can see my other daughter who's not been on a team. I can see it. And then my daughter who's in theater, I can see that she's been part of a team. Um, it, it, t- teamwork is so important. I, you you went back to the military before. Well, I mentioned, and then you brought it up that, that did, was that the first time or was that team really important to me? And I think my mother kind of uh, directed kind of my, how intense I am about, in OCD about everything. But I think the military really made me understand I'm the least important person in the room. And that was really important for me at a young age that, yes, I can be the most important person in the room if I'm told to be. But I'd rather just be part of the team. And I think I get that from the military. That's so good because part of what I think military and athletics does is it gives you structure for teamwork, for we are trying, we, these people are trying to accomplish this thing. And you have a coach who's going to say, here's how we're going to do it. And I have to rely on you. And then you're going to rely on me. Right. So if you have not had that structure of, um, one of the things that Tinto says is uh, learning communities helps you develop an appreciation for cooperation, which is what we're saying. Like if you have not been on a team and you don't appreciate, we have to come together and cooperate together, which when I was thinking about this, I was laughing because cooperate is co-operate. We're going to operate together. Right. And I was thinking, you know, there are some people who will operate but not co like, I don't want to do it with you. I'm going to be fine. And then there are other people who are like, I'll co I'll do it with you, but I'm not operating. Like, I'm and, not- you know what, and you know what the secret of success in the world is, is for people to think you're cooperating, even if you're not cooperating. And that to me is the nuance of life, right? Yeah. It's like, I've been in plenty of times where I've been on teams or I've tried to get a, a goal done and I'm not the most cooperative person, but no one's mad at me. And that's right. the nuance of it. It's like, I am doing it my way and I'm doing it in my silo, but you all think I'm part of the team. I'm not really yeah. part of the team. <laughs> you think I am because I'm really good at nuance. Right. And that's part of that learning and navigating within the people who are around you. How do we exist together and get a thing done without 
killing each other. Yeah, and, that, and, you know, that's the key. And, you know, the biggest problem with teamwork is the person that does step up is usually, you know, that usually, I shouldn't say that, but sometimes the person that steps up is not capable and that destroys the entire team. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting, the, the principle of people who are eager to do that kind of work, to be the boss, to tell everyone what to do. A lot of times, because they're not humble, it's not the kind of person that you want to, to follow behind, right? <laughs> Me and my partner we were just having a conversation yesterday, and we were talking about this 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 thing I was dealing with a couple months ago, and we came down. I was like, "Why do you think that thing blew up a little bit?" And and she goes, "Well, maybe it was when you told the guy who was in charge, like things that you shouldn't tell people unless you're on the streets of Brooklyn." I was like, "Yeah, that probably was it. That was probably it." Because my new right. out the window. Yeah, I use I I use very strong direct squaring up words on him and and then i wondered why everything because <laughs> can anybody think of anything that might have happened where <laughs> this went well, down <laughs> yeah you, you apparently you're not allowed to talk to people that way but you know what if you're going to be a leader and you're going to and you're going to run the team then you, you have to manage me if you can't manage me i'm going to tell you about that yeah and even though i'm a consultant and i'm kind of not i don't work for you and you don't work for me and i'm consulting and you don't know how to manage me if you let it manage me, I am the easiest person in the world. I will do anything you ask me to do. Yeah. Anything. I will be your best worker. I'll work 18 hours a day, seven days a week, and I'll act like my whole life depends on you. I am that guy. Yeah. You don't know how to manage me? It's, it's not going to go great. Yeah. Well, I think that, but that, that's not just unique to me. I think that's no. unique to what you're talking about, teams. And I and what I appreciate about that is if we think about learning communities and we think about saying to somebody, you know, you're having a conflict with your with your roommate or, hey, when you talk to a person like that, they don't like you, right? Or what is a way that we could solve this problem so that we all win? I mean, that is so important in those formative years for students to be successful, not just to graduate, but to be able to go on through life and know a truth about themselves. Yeah, and it's critical because most kids, like I, I was the kid in class that never spoke up. I was the kid in class that always got the stars because I sat there with my hands like this and I never spoke up. And, but once somebody gave me the opportunity to speak up, then I can take over the room. Right. And so, so it's really important for leaders or the person in charge of that community to really give those opportunities in a non-threatening way. Right. And, and everything to a kid is threatening. So it's got to be really in a way that is extraordinarily comfortable. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, okay. I also have a question. So I'm going to put up the five benefits that Tinto talks about for learning community. Um, we've talked about an appreciation for cooperation. He talks about active learning, which this is just, it's engaged learning. We're doing a thing together. I'm not listening to a lecture, um, learning together, which I want to pause there because I was thinking about people who you learn well with, which is different than teamwork, right? So like I, have a team at Ferris that I love. I, if I always say like any problem that ever arises, these are the people I want to help me with it. It doesn't matter what the problem is. I love their brains. We have a great balance. We have great teamwork. Um, I don't know that I could learn with all of them because we would do it in such opposite ways. Right. And so thinking about learning together, there's this sweet spot of like, you and I are similar enough that we speak the same kind of language. We think about things in the same way. We would want to order the way that we're learning, but we also have strengths that maybe are going to make each other better as opposed to your team where like when Matt and I are thinking about building a team, we're like, what are we missing? Who is different from us? Who's going to be awesome at this thing that I'm terrible at, right? So it's a little bit different that learning together versus trying to accomplish a thing. And I didn't know for you, Anthony, as you're thinking about making a team, like, are you super conscious about we need these people? Oh. Like, you're going to bring this, you're going to bring this, you're going to bring this. That's all I think about. That's all I think about. Um, I don't like duplication um, of, yeah. of the same skill set. I'm good at everything, but I'm only a little bit good at everything. So I can ask important questions to an accountant, to an operations person, to an engineer, to a designer. But like you can learn in in a, in a, in a uh, with ten questions that I only know 
a little bit of those 10 questions. So I can ask intelligent questions, but it gets away from me real quick. So I don't need someone that knows a little bit of everything. Right. I need experts in their field. And then I will be able to bring those people together. And because I, I know how that all functions and how that all works together. And I'm kind of the expert of not a lot, but everything. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's like, sure. I, know how, I know how it's structured. So I never look for someone that has my organizational skills or my um, ability to bring people together. I look for deep knowledge of each subject. I just had this on a team I built and there was this one person that had this deep knowledge of something I didn't. And it lo almost looked like duplicate, uh, like they, they were kind of similar to me. I was like, no, no, no. They, yeah, they can run a team, but they, they have some deep, deep knowledge that I just don't have. So yeah. absolutely. I, that's all I think about. I don't like duplications of, of work because it's unnecessary. I like, I like taking somebody that's really, really creative and really like crazy that needs somebody to manage them and someone that barely speaks, but really kind of sits in the corner and keeps us all out of trouble because as we're <laughs> losing our minds, they're like, Oh, these people are crazy. And then at the last minute when we're all about to be, you know, blow ourselves up, they go, I've been watching you guys. And I think if we do it this way, and then all of a sudden they change the ship. Yeah. The turn the ship. So, so yeah, I, I very, very careful of who I bring onto my team. And I, I think the reflection of here's what I bring and here's what you bring. And we need a person who can, I think that's such a powerful conversation to have within learning communities on a college campus to be able to say, I mean, can you imagine if you did group work and you were like, okay, let's craft our team. Like who are the people that we want to have on this team together? Here's what I can bring. Here's what you can bring. Um, also, when you have the right people on your team, a task comes up and everybody knows who's going to do that because they like doing it and they're good at it. Right. As opposed to, oh gosh, now we have to figure out who's going to do this thing that we are all terrible but, at. But, but you know what, they, 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 to me, the critical, the, the failure of teams is when you bring people on that the majority of people can't speak up. They don't feel safe to speak up. I like everybody on my team. Well, you know, sometimes I think they, they feel comfortable speaking up and sometimes they don't. But I think when people are afraid to say what they're thinking is the collapse of a team, is the collapse of a school, the collapse of, of any business. And so getting that kid in the corner or that person in the corner that doesn't really speak that much, knowing that when they are ready to speak, they can speak. Just because I speak faster, I speak louder, and I speak more than most people, like you can tell me to shut up. Like you need to be able to have that ability to tell me to shut up. Or I need to have the ability to know that you want to tell me to shut up. And that <laughs> is really, really critical. Yeah, I, um, I can think of a couple of different times where I felt like the most important thing to do in this group is to hold space for this person right. because they have a thing to say and they're not saying it and they're not saying it. And so to be like, Hey, hold on everybody. Do you have something that you want to add to that? Or like, I want to sit. It's really funny if you think about external processors versus internal processors and how I have had to say in many meetings, can we just sit for a minute? because I need to think that through and I'm looking at my team members and I can see that they need to think it through. So can we just have space and quiet for a minute so that we can make sure we're saying everything we need to say. It's a really powerful tool for people yeah, yeah. who can't, can't jump in fast enough. And, right? I, and I like the fact that you said hold space because when I walk into a room, typically I'm either running the room or people are waiting for me to come in to do a keynote speech or whatever, or even an interview if I'm with my team and people kind of look at me first. And that many times I've said, Let's see what this person thinks. Let's see what that person thinks. Like, because when you are the person that people are looking at, whether you're the leader of the team or whatever it is, it's like people around you get lost. And 99% right. of the work and 99% of the success is my team. It's not me. And so I've learned over the years to make sure that my team is always in the forefront and I try to step back. Because even when I step back, people try to push me forward. So right. it's really, really critical to hold, to hold space for people. I, I like the way you said that. Yeah. Um, I think all of this reflection on learning, on not just the academics and the subject, which faculty have a lot to say, but for our listeners to be able to say, we want the best learning we want the best community. We want the best experience for our students. And that is an equal um, bridge of the academic piece. And then what I call lab work, right? Because it's like, 
you might go and learn psychology, but your lab is working with your roommate or, or having to live with your roommate, right? That's your lab where all of that stuff that you're learning about now, all of a sudden, this becomes a, an application for you to be able to practice. You're going doing speech class. The lab is you have to convince your group of friends to not go do something stupid. That's persuasive communication. That's where you're going to actually get that practice. And so having the best learning and the best community experience comes when schools are putting equal emphasis on both sides. Um, and it doesn't always happen at schools. Some schools, it's like academics is the most important thing. And oh yeah, I was laughing Tinto in, in Tinto's article, which is a little bit old. He's like the, the forefather of retention. So it's a little bit old. He didn't talk about student development professionals. He talked about student service professionals, which is really funny because he's thinking like, I'm in this academic faculty world. And then there are these other people who do stuff like get them their schedules and check them into their room. But it's a different perspective. The academic piece is really important, but the student development piece is so important to making sure that we are developing our students into, into students who are going to be successful. Yeah, so I think and, that balance is important. And, and, you know, students typically don't tell you what's on their mind. And the, the, I guess, I, I, you know, you as a professional educator, your number one priority is to draw that out of people. And that's yeah. tough. You know, that, that, that's a tough thing to do. Um, it, people can't draw me out even when I was younger. So I, I, I see that that even with my own children, I was like, what are they really thinking? They're telling me what they're thinking, but that's not what they're thinking. And it's hard to draw them out. Yeah, for sure. And I think one of the really powerful tools that we have in our toolkit is um, observation and meta communication. So I don't have to know what's going on with you, but I can say, Hey, I noticed that, um, when we have meetings, you're really quiet. And I was just wondering if that's because you don't have anything to say or because it's difficult for you to jump in or because it takes you longer to process. And so we're not, we're not holding enough space for you. Can you help me understand that? So how about that, if I say to you, how about, I'm not to interrupt you, but how about if I say to you, I'm good. Yeah. Well, this is where, you know, I've said to you before, having evidence, like hot, like saying, I understand that you're saying you're good, but here's what I, what I see because you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I have told you that my mother called the vice pre, uh, president of my school and said, she's not doing well. And then I said, why did you do that? Now I have to go lie to him. And I did, I went and sat in his office. He's like, how are you? And I was like, I'm great. Everything's fine. <laughs> so it is difficult to draw people out, but I think that touch point connection, those relationships are so important because you have to trust the person is going to be on your team and help you, right? right? If, you, if, if you look at all like the celebrities and everybody that's out in the world, you know, if you look at Shaq, if, no matter who he's interacting with, young kids, old people, whatever, people that know him as a basketball player, people that don't, there's something about he draws people out. You just want to be around the guy, right? Yeah. And and I he was, he was in Vegas when I was in Vegas and the guy sitting next to me in a meeting said, hey, I just checked in with Jack, Shaq last night into my hotel. And I was like, how was he? He goes, oh, my God, he held the camera for me. We took three selfies. Like, he's like, he had nothing to do. And he's like so busy, but he he drew me out. Like, I wanted to hang out with him. Like, I almost had to say, hey, Shaq, I got to go now. It's like, like that's yeah. amazing to me that somebody has that ability when you know that he's been asked for photos with somebody a million times. Right. Like, I I'm asked for a photo with somebody. I take the photo and I, I go. Like, I don't have that ability to be like Shaq. And well, it's amazing. Yeah, I think what you're describing is this idea of like the power of presence yes. and some people have it where it's like when they are with you, they are with you and they're looking at you and there is literally nothing that is more important in the world than being present with you in this moment. And when you meet people like that, it is just intoxicating. You're just like, I want to be around this person all the time. And, and that's professors seen. and leaders of, of colleges, it is, it, it should be a prerequisite to be able to have that skill. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. Although it's very hard to find people. I think, especially today, we live in such a distracted world that it is a great reminder. You know, we're always talking about seeing our students. Um, and I have a colleague who is telling me that she was a first generation college student. And she said, I remember my first semester. I wasn't sure I fit. I didn't know what I was doing really. I was like, I'm not sure. She said, I was going into my res hall and somebody said to me, hi, Holly. 
And she said, in that moment, I thought, somebody sees me, somebody knows who I am. Maybe there's a place for me in this community. Maybe I'm going to make connections, right? But just seeing a person and speaking their name was so but powerful you, to her. But to your point, like so many distractions. Look, this morning, I'm in front of Grand Central Station. Uh, I'm, I'm no, not um, Grand Central Station. No, not Grand Central Station. Um, yeah, let's say Grand Central Station. So I'm, 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 I'm waiting for the light. And there's bicycles and, you know, all kinds of things going through the light, you know, motorcycles or whatever. And I'm sitting at the light and there's this young lady, she's in front of Morgan Stanley's uh, office building. And she's literally not in the middle of the street, but not too far away from the middle of the street. <laughs> and she stops and she's texting. And she's very well dressed. You can tell she's a, a young professional. She looks like she's a very responsible young lady, probably top of her class. She just looks like that kid, right? Yeah. Maybe she's third. I shouldn't call her a kid. And she's like so distracted that whatever it is on that text, that she literally almost got herself killed because she stopped in the middle of an intersection. And, and then all of a sudden she looked up and like started walking, but then went right back. And again, if you've been in New York City lately, the motorcycles and bicycles aren't stopping for lights. Yeah. And it's crazy that, that, that the world is that distracted. This that person, distracted. who you can tell is a responsible person, is so distracted that she, in the middle of one of the busiest streets in New York City, stops to respond to a text message. And is not thinking about her actual physical body being in a place where it can get run over, right? Like oh, you're so <laughs> Right. It's like, it's like the, 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 like the, the danger of light is like literally pounding danger, danger, <laughs> danger. And she's like, no, let me stop in the middle of the street and take this text message. Oh my goodness. So when not, you, so that, you know, it, I'm really seeing for the first time in my, my, all my years on this earth that people are really starting to your point, the, the, the words you used in the beginning, I can't remember the words you used, but it, it's, we went from being completely burnt out to just demoralized, demoralized. We're just like, whatever, man, you know, yeah. and you see it on people's faces. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Okay. I, sorry, Anthony, I always enjoy talking to you. And then I'm like, oh, wait, I have to make sure that I make this point. So I would, I think maybe we should just do four hours together and people can, can like meander in and out, you know? Listen, listen, you and I can do a talk show. That would be probably the number one talk show. On TV. <laughs> I mean, I think it would be good. I would listen to it. So I want to put punctuation on Tinto's article, learning community. And I want to say, please think about student success we are talking about learning about yourself, about other people. Yes, about your academic subject. We are talking about learning, but we are also talking about community and development, self-development, growing into a, a more mature, wiser person. We are talking about in college, your achievements. We're talking about your path forward. And I like to remember, I mean, I would challenge people to think about their college friends. Like there's a reason why those are people that you are, are lifelong friends that you stick with. I didn't even have that many friends and my college friends are my lifelong friends, right? Because you are in this community experiment where you are doing everything together. And as adults, we don't have this. We don't live in this community where we're doing everything together and we're on the same track and we're, we have families and we work here and then we have church and then we do these other things, but it is not the same experience as a learning community. And right? you see it, like my kids just graduated college last year and you already see that they, they're connected to their friends and they're going to stay connected, but they're busy. And like it's I said, the well, there's this one kid that my daughter's very good friends with and I go, what happened? You know, what happened? It's like, you know, we're busy. And it's and 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 I try to teach them that in college. It's like, listen, you suck every ounce up because yeah. when life gets busy, you can't hang out, man. You just right. can't. I mean, you see it with single friends that are like in their 40s, and then they're like, hey man, you don't hang out anymore. It's like, what? You <laughs> got a family, bro. I have a lot of crazy things going on, right? Right. right. Yeah. So yeah, it's um yeah, it, you have to, but also at least for me, I have to work really hard at making that community and, and making sure I stay strong in that community. Yeah. I just, I had a political difference with a good friend of mine from high school and I was afraid that we're having lunch with him. It would come up and it did come up and we hugged and we kissed at the end of it and we didn't argue or scream. 
I was like, you know, I, I don't understand his point of view. As a matter of fact, I think his point of view is completely asinine. But <laughs> it, it didn't ruin our relationship. And I right. still love him. I, I still kill for him. Because you learned how to do life with people, right? I mean, like, that's what we're talking about is like, it's okay. I love you. And we can stay connected, even though I think you're crazy town, which, you know, that happens sometimes. But do um, life with people. You have to learn how to do life with people. I'm going to get a t-shirt. You do. You absolutely do. And I, and I, I will just say, I am worried about the last 22 months and the delay that our students are having across the board about doing life with people. Well, listen, man, um, people got real comfortable sitting in bed all day. Yeah, I know that's true. I, like, my, one of my daughters had to do quarantine, man. I've never seen anybody do quarantine better than my daughter. I think I would be really good at quarantine. She spent Probably. 11 days, dude, and she never came off the second floor. And she 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 owned quarantine. Anthony, that's so funny because Shauna, I just did a conference with Shauna and she's an extreme extrovert. So like quarantine sounds like lovely to me. So we were doing, we were working the booth and she said, hey, it was a very late night at the conference. It was like a thing from eight to 10. She's like, hey, what are we going to do if only five people come? And the introvert said, go home. And the extrovert said, have a party with five people, I guess. <laughs> like, that is the best example of introversion, extroversion I have heard in a very long time. Yeah, it's interesting because both of us seem extroverted. We're both the same person. I think you and I are very similar. Yeah. Whereas like, we're, we're the first person, you know, to, to go look for the hole. Yeah. I'm going to go up to my room. Right. Okay. Friends, listen, if you have missed any of our um, episodes. So starting uh, August 24th, we did commitment. Then we did expectations, support, feedback, involvement. And then today we've been talking about learning and learning communities. Please go back, share that with your colleagues. Um, I do have, I think four action items because I always like to leave you with something to do. Five action items. First of all, please try to figure out what students are leaving. If you're doing spark reports with you, we're giving that to you where we're talking about are these first generation college students? Are these um, college students whose parents have already gone to college? And is it that it is too rigorous for them? It is not rigorous enough. That kind of um, parsing out will be really helpful for you as you're trying to figure out what to do in your academic side. Also, think about the teams that you're on. So as we're talking about group work and talk about your roles, Matt was just telling me that the Cowboys did this awesome exercise where they said to everybody on the team, the Dallas Cowboys, um, hey, write down what you think your role is on this team. So write that down. And then they passed it around to everybody else and said, you write down what you need this person's role on the team to be. And the difference between I thought I was supposed to be the encourager. And they're like, no, your job is to get the ball and run it for a touchdown, right? That discrepancy of like what I think I'm providing and what we really need from you, I think is so powerful. I think that's like fascinating. I'm going to do that uh, next yeah. time. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm in that situation. That's a really good idea. Yeah, I love that. I think it's great. Also, you guys be looking for your learning communities and assessing them. So like I said, it's a little bit of an old concept. And so sometimes what that means is like we did it on our campus and then we never assessed it and thought about it again. So if you have those, you want to go back and make sure that it makes sense and that you're um, in incorporating learning and community into that. Also, my favorite best practice, and we have a couple of schools who are doing this, but if you have first year experience classes, I love the model where you allow your faculty to teach whatever they want, like the content, like I want to teach on Star Wars, or I want to teach on um, this game, or I, whatever faculty love, just let them do their content. And you can wait, uh, weave in things like how to study and how to register and that sort of thing. But then you would have a whole list of classes that are really interesting that students would be able to pick based on similar interests. Faculty like it because they get to talk about a thing they're interested in. Students are kind of self-selecting kind of similar people because we all want to talk about little women or whatever. Um, and then you build your learning communities around those self-selected interesting topics. And I would also just encourage you to leave space, hold space in those classes for your latecomers. So what happens a lot of times is you have like a superstar faculty and they want to talk about Star Wars and that class gets totally full. And then you have late applicants and they have to go to the stupid class that's about 
I don't know what's stupid, something stupid. Um, so being able to hold a couple of spaces in your superstar faculty classes so that you can put students that maybe have lower institutional commitment or late deposits in there to get them really well connected. That is it, my- It's interesting. Yeah, I think it's really fun. All right, well, you have spent another hour with me. You've answered another 19 questions. Had a little psychological Rachel magic. An hour I will never get back. <laughs> <laughs> gone. It's totally gone. Um, but I always appreciate you, Anthony. I really appreciate your perspective on seeing people and how to build the right teams and how to how to just be present with other people as we're trying to accomplish something, right? Yeah, I'm trying to put together something in my new keynote speech where I am like I'm hyper concerned, if that's the right word or words, um, about this inability to live around what was what how did you say it live around humans yeah live around i'm really humans. hyper concerned about it um i'm seeing it over and over again i'm going to give you a quick story okay um before we go i know we're kind of but this is really <laughs> what i'm talking about and i'll leave the brand out okay the brand this gentleman owns 32 hotels with different brands one of the brands he owns a lot of hotels with say several and the brand stopped, you know, cut down all their executives for two years during COVID. But the owner who owns the hotel and pays the fee to the brand had to pay all his people to keep the hotel running, even at 30% occupancy. So the, the brand can go away and just say, oh, yeah, we're still here. Um, but you got to pay your people. And my people are on, you know, layaway, basically. Yeah. And um, so it's two different stresses, right? The brand's trying to be relevant but they don't have the payroll that this guy has or this lady yeah. has. So now business starts picking up a little bit, still not where it needs to be, still the services that the brand wants implemented, the, this hotel can't do. So the brand said, you know what? We're going to start evaluating our hotels again. We're going to start sending inspectors around and we're going to start rating you again. And this hotel has had really great inspect, check, inspections, top of the heap, great hotel, great owner, fantastic. Well, the evaluator fails the hotel based on not having a full American breakfast and something else. Oh, no. Okay. The owner calls up the president of the brand and flips out on it. And this, to me, is the problem. How in God's name can you be the leader of a brand or even the number two leader of a brand, send your evaluators out, take a hotel that's one of the best hotels you have in the system, and fail them because they're having struggles of putting in these systems. Now, a real leader would have said, no one gets failed. No one gets a really yeah. bad mark unless it winds up my desk and I talk to the owner. Excuse my dog in the background. No, you're fine. So, I mean, it just does not play well with others, right? It is a lack of empathy. It is a lack of leadership. It is a lack of self-awareness and emotional uh, awareness to act like this is the right thing to do. It's, it, it really pissed me off. That's the only thing I can say. It really pissed me off. Yeah. We got to get some stuff right. We got to work out some stuff. That is for sure true. Yeah. You, you're, you're, trying to, you're trying to survive, but you're crushing the people that are making you survive. Without well, them, you wouldn't have a company. Yeah. That's how you kill morale. And that's how you move from uh, stressed out and burnout to disillusioned, right? And like, to be honest with you, why are we doing this? And the brand that that, that it happened, I'm not surprised. They have, you're like, yep, that's what I would expect. Yeah. All right. Well, we do have some things to work out, but we'll have to do it another time. Thank you for spending time with me, Anthony. Friends, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we, I don't know what we're talking about next week. I don't have the schedule in front of me, but it's going to be super exciting and helpful. And if you have things that you'd like to recommend, or if you have um, specific issues that you want us to talk about, or if you know something, someone amazing at what they do, please send me an email because I would love to have them on and spend some time with them. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Good to spend time with you.